In order to understand what has driven Congolese refugees to flee their homes, it is necessary to know the history of the current crisis. Prior to independence, the Congolese suffered under the brutal colonial rule of Belgium. King Leopold of Belgium personally owned the colony, then called the Congo Free State, and it is estimated that 10 million deaths can be attributed to his rule. The brutality of the rule was such that the Belgian parliament was pressured into taking control of the colony from Leopold in 1908, but the horrific treatment continued up until independence. However, Congolese independence did not mean the end of the turmoil and suffering, with the first democratically elected prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, immediately being forced to deal with secessionists and rebel movements in the country. Mobutu Sese Seko ruled the Congo, which he renamed Zaire, after he took control of the country through a coup of the elected government of Patrice Lumumba. Mobutu ruled the country from 1965 to 1997. Mobutu's regime was ousted after the Rwandan genocide ended with Paul Kagame's Rwandan Patriotic Front seizing control of Rwanda. Hutus, who feared retribution from the Tutsi-dominated government, fled the country en masse to eastern Zaire. Mobutu allowed them to set up military and political bases there, where they attacked Rwanda from. Rwanda began sending military aid to Tutsis within the Congo, and this began to heavily destabilize the country. Mobutu was ousted in the First Congo War by domestic rebels and foreign, primarily Rwandan and Ugandan, forces. It is here where the roots of the current conflicts can be seen. The violence today has its roots in ethnic conflict that has existed since the colonial era, but was exacerbated by Mobutu's dictatorship. The current and more recent fighting can be largely attributed to the events that started in 1994 with the Rwandan genocide. The alliance Rwanda formed for the invasion broke apart in 1998, when the new Congolese government ordered Rwandan troops out of the country. Directly after this, many regional rebellions and militias formed. Neighboring governments once again invaded, and although a peace agreement was signed in 2003, the eastern regions of the Congo continued to be racked with armed militias, corruption, and weak governments as a result of domestic instability and continued foreign interference. According to the UN, there are currently about 5 million people who have been internally displaced within the DRC, and millions have been forced to flee to neighboring countries. Current refugees come primarily from the provinces of North and South Kivu, and are fleeing genocide and tribal warfare. The ongoing conflict in the Eastern Congo has no end in sight, with the UN stating that, according to the 2022 Humanitarian Needs Overview, no improvement in the humanitarian situation is expected in 2023 and 2024. So tonight I want to talk, you, I want to, talk to you about this beautiful country, Congo. Congo is my country and is the second large just country in Africa. Uh, my father, as I said, he was an immigration officer. And one day on his work, they saw something they should not see, him and his colleague. It was a truck full of guns who from Rwanda to Congo. As you can see, Rwanda is a neighbor country in Eastern. Uh, when they start asking questions about that truck, there's people who came say, don't ask anything, just let the truck pass. And they no, we want to see. One day, when my father knew that he was the target, he came home, he says, we want to leave. Before we could leave, the people of guns come home and take, kill my father and my mother. So me and my brother, we ran away. We jumped the window and we ran away. So we ran away to Uganda. And when we reached Uganda, we told the authority. And they said, oh, so you're here, you're refugees. That was my first time to hear a refugee. My status changed. I became a refugee. And then they sent us to refugee camp. Because that was a little food, it was very little to us. So you have to choose to eat once a day. There's no breakfast, no supper. So we choose me and my brother to eat only once a day, it was dinner, so that we can sleep full. We ran away from war, but we are also dying in this camp. I buried two, my two children here, and it's really hard for a parent to, bear, to bury their own children. So we are going back to Congo. They went back with other families. After six months, 
they're coming back again, half a family and some, none of them. They say, man, maybe they died. And they told us, man, there is no home again. Maybe here we will die slowly, but there it's a violence. But after eight years in that camp, full of misery, the United States came, immigration. They came to help refugees like me who could not go back and who were stuck there. It was a part in the refugee camp because people, even if me, I knew, I believe that United States is a half paradise. But the process is too long. It took us three years for interviews and interviews, medical screening, and then we reach here last year. In September when we came, we reached at airport, Columbus Airport. We saw people who came to see us. We full of smile. And I was like, I don't know those people, but they're smiling. Why are they smiling? <laughs> yeah, it was so crazy to see people. Don't know, but they're smiling for you. It, it, it was a great feeling. And they say, hello, hello, come, come, welcome, welcome to America. So they took us home and they give us food. They took us to our room. I see the bed, blanket that smelled good. And it was so good to see a bed again, a blanket that is so good. Even if it was cold at that time, it was so nice. I, I remember I used to wake up in the middle of the night, just open the fridge and see all of this food is mine. I could not believe and I knew that my father wanted us to go back to school. Now I'm going back to school to get my GED in Columbus Community College. I'm doing GED preparation classes. Uh, I want to give you an advice. You know, refugees keep coming, some of them. And you know, in a refugee camp, there is no supermarket. There is no this technology. And you can find people acting weird in the supermarket. If it's a refugee, please don't be mad at him, mad at him or her. Please help him. Because the first time when I also went to Walmart, I see the door open itself and I was like, <laughs> Who's, who opened this door? <laughs> you, know, you know, we act weird. So thank you so much. Thank you.